Velkommen tilbake til D2021, og for en dag det har vært så langt. Vi har hatt mange spennende innledere, og jeg må si, jeg kjenner at jeg virkelig har trua på fremtiden da, etter å ha hørt på disse innlederne. Og nå, dere, nå vet jeg at vi skal få en person som er noen av de dyktigste vi har her i landet. Nada Ahmed, hun har bodd over hele verden, og blir kalt en ekspert på innovasjon. Og i 2020 så var hun på listen over topp 50 kvinner i teknologi i Norge. I dag så er hun Vice President Transformation hos Aker Solution. Og det er en ære å få lov til å gi podiet til deg. Og hvorfor er mangfold så viktig for innovasjonen? Det er det vi skal høre mer om nå. Så Nada, da er scenen og podiet ditt. Publikum, det er bare å glede seg. Welcome on the stage. Thank you, Jürgen. So happy to be here today, and I just love, love the enthusiasm. Today we're discussing a very important topic, why diversity is so important for innovation. So diversity is important. I think it's um, if you look at all the research, it's been shown to show that innovation is driven by more diversity, and you need diversity so that we can actually advance in society. And for me to really show you the advantages of including a more diverse workforce, let me start by telling you a story. This is a story about a woman called Catalin Carrico. She grew up in Hungary and was a daughter of a butcher. She grew up watching him cut up these animals and was very curious about the biology behind it. So she decided that she's going to be a scientist. She had never seen a scientist before, but she knew that's what she wanted to study. So she did her PhD in Hungary and decided to come to the US to do her postgraduate studies. But it wasn't an easy ride. She faced many impediments and for decades was in the US without getting a permanent position and was just getting rejection after rejection to get a post, to get a grant, and was just really hanging on to the fringes of academia. But this woman had a passion for messenger and RNA. So what's known as today as mRNA that many of us have heard today has been really the key, the key to finding successful vaccines during the COVID crisis. And so Catalin, she believed from a very young age, you know, early on in her research that there was something magical about the mRNA and it could really hold the secret to curing many diseases. But for years, given her un the uncertainty and her tumultuous career, moving from one lab to another and really relying on senior scientists, she, was really, she found it really hard to get her idea through. And, you know, she knew that uh, the mRNA cell could uh, be included in um, as, as a medicine and also as a vaccine. And she applied for a lot of grants to be able to study this. And even in certain cases, she applied for a grant where you had seven applicants in total and they had six spots and hers was the only one that got rejected. So no one wanted to bet on her idea. Why, you may ask? Well, perhaps because she was challenging the status quo. She was going against the conventional wisdom. Her idea was so outrageous that it was far beyond the imagination of established scientific community. She was so different. Her way of thinking was different. And she was looking at things from a different angle. She persisted and for decades continued to research the mRNA and built on her research a successful experiment that when she entered this mRNA into monkeys uh, with um, a protein that stimulates the production of red blood cells, she saw that their blood count increased. Yet, despite that successful experiment, no one wanted to fund her research. She reached out to pharmaceuticals, to venture capitalists, but there was just no interest in this area. Eventually, after decades, 
there were two small biotech firms that said, hmm, this is something interesting. So they took notice. In January 2020, when the Chinese scientist uh, released the gen genetic sequence of the virus, thanks to the work of Dr. Carrico, BioNTech designed a vaccine in a matter of hours and Moderna in two days. Today, Catalin Karinko emerges as one of the unsung heroes of COVID-19 vaccine development, and her work laid the foundation for this breakthrough vaccine made by Pfizer and Moderna. Pfizer ended up partnering with BioNTech to develop its max vaccines, and together they developed vaccines in the fastest pace ever in the history of humanity. I'm telling you this story because imagine we live in a world where there's so many Dr. Carricos who are not recognized, who are not believed in, who are not valued because their ideas are different, because they look different, because they think differently. But their ideas hold the key to future innovative discoveries and breakthrough solutions. Yet, we let our systematic barriers and systematic impediments come in our way, our biases come in our way from actually letting these people in to our dominant way of thinking. What Catalin Karinko did is exactly what innovation is all about. She challenged how things are done. She challenged the status quo and she asked questions. She ble believed so deeply in her intuition that she kept on working on this, even if she was just working with other senior scientists. And she ran systematic experiments over and over again so that she could learn and even try to prove herself wrong. Innovation is exactly this journey, to learn from your failures, to do these experiments so that you can prove that you're wrong and that uh, to prove, to try to prove that you're wrong so that you can actually show how you're advancing a particular idea. So it's about creating new products and services. It's about doing things differently. And it's about creating products that produce better results than before. And it's about adding value to society. In a homogenous environment where everything is the same, where everyone thinks the same, everyone looks the same, has the same abilities and the same limitations, innovation stagnates. You don't have enough new perspectives to challenge the traditional path. There are not enough people who are asking questions. You don't even feel the need to do things differently because things work and you kind of lose that curiosity. But working with people who are different challenges our brain to overcome this stale and linear way of working and, and thinking. And it really sharpens performance. And we've seen that over and over again in teams. When people use varying tools for solving complicated tasks, they come together and work inclusively to find solutions. The results are powerful. There was a London study done recently that showed that a culturally diverse leadership are more likely to develop new products than those with homogenous leadership. And if you look at some of the most innovative companies today, uh, globally, what comes to your mind are Facebook, Amazon, Apple. And if you look inside, they exhibit higher gender diversity and ethnic diversity. And there's a clear evidence from lots of studies, including BCG that came out recently, that shows that diversity draws innovation. And they looked at the most innovative companies in 2021, and they had a higher ratio of diverse leadership. In 2017, McKinsey did a study that found that if you had higher di gender diversity in your leadership team, you had 15% better prof profitability. And if you had higher ethnic diversity, then you performed 33% better on the bottom line. So the business case for diversity is compelling. It brings new ideas and new ways of thinking. Yet 
even in the Nordics, where we champion equality, where we believe that we have made so much strides, executives at the top of the corporate ladder in the Nordics are still strikingly white and male. In 120 biggest companies in the Nordics, only 80% of the leadership that have profit and loss responsibilities are 80% um, are, are male, so only 20% are women. And between 60 to 80% of, of these have people, people in leadership who come from um, the same countries where the companies are headquartered. So this makes the Nordic companies less able to compete in the international markets because we need to enhance our, comp uh, our competitiveness we need to include more diverse force, uh, workforce, and we need to be able to represent and mirror the society that we li uh, live in. As, um, as corporations, we want to persevere. We're in there for the long, long run. But to do that, we have to continuously innovate, especially today in the time of unprecedented technology, technological advancements, where you have disruptors, startups all around us, upending our business models. We don't have a choice but to be innovating and staying ahead of the game. And to me, that means that we don't have a choice but to include diverse voices, because innovation can only come when you have people who can think differently. Diverse workforce reflects today's marketplace, and through customer, uh, consumer insights and wisdom of the crowd, we can actually lead more creativity and innovation into the work. People see problems and solutions from different angles, and diverse teams outperform teams composed of the best individuals because the diversity of perspective and problem solving trumps individual ability. I think this is so, so important. This finding is very relevant as it means that for the kind of workforce where we're living in today, where most of us work from home, our office-based workers, people with physical disabilities can add in perspectives that we're lacking without any limitations to the work. However, people don't fit the dominant group and they don't, the people who don't fit the dominant group, they don't have access to the same education, to the same career development paths, to the same exposure to, to the job market in a way that everyone else has. So we have these systematic barriers that are put in place that leave people behind. People of diverse backgrounds, people with disabilities, uh, people who speak differently, look differently, um, and who think differently. So, so a common challenge for us is how do we remove these systematic barriers so that more and more diverse people can actually be part of solving problems for us. One of the other common phenomena of a homogenous workflows, workflow where there isn't diversity is groupthink. We need cognitive diversity. So we need people who can think differently and interrupt problems differently. Groupthink is a phenomena that occurs when a lot of people who are in a group are well-intentioned, but they make irrational and non-optimal decisions because they want to go with the common belief of the group. And they don't believe that it's possible for them to disagree or go against what the common understanding is. And this is often a problem because the consensus is often not based on that data and is either fueled by a particular agenda or it's just so that we can maintain this harmony and coherence. But if you can get more diversity in the team, that's where you get critical thought and that's where you get people challenging the group thing. And this is really, really a big phenomena that we see on our boards, on our leadership team, where everyone just agrees to the common conventional wisdom without enough dissenting voices being introduced. And you know, this leads me to my next point. It's not enough to hire diverse candidates. You also have to include them. 
Diversity introduces friction. And having diverse voices is not seamless. It's often painful and it's messy as you're disrupting the harmony of the homogenous group. So you really need to put in the effort to get people to speak up and feel comfortable and feel like it's a safe place where they can challenge the status quo and they can express their opinion. There was a very famous experiment that was done at Google, which is called the Aristotle experiment, in which they really wanted to study what are the characteristics of a high performing team? What, uh, what are, is the sort of makeup of the team, but also what are the norms? How do they actually perform? And there are two important things that they found out from this study as they looked at all the thousands of different teams in Google. They found that number one, teams where all participants were contributing the same amount of time in terms of the, uh, the conversation, in terms of the discussion, throughout the day, the average time spent speaking was the same amongst the entire group. They were performing better. Secondly, a group that was able to have psychological safety. That means the group where there was trust and mutual respect, where people felt that it was safe to disagree because they're not going to lose their job and that their, um, their colleagues are still going to uh, respect them. So this is exactly what we need in times of change and transformation. We need voices who challenge us and we need them to help redirect and help us think differently. But we can't do that unless we can create an inclusive environment where people feel safe and they can speak up. And it's not dominated just by a small group of um, loud speakers, because then the study showed that the collective intelligence of the group declined when only two or three people were taking the dominant stand and we're discussing and talking the most amount. So, I mean, for me, this was a big finding. So when I lead teams, I make sure that I get input from the entire team and get them to contribute, to discuss their ideas, to speak up. Because if it's just dominated by two or three people, then we're actually limiting, limiting ourselves and are not leveraging the collective intelligence of the team. And, and, you know, the second point about psychological safety, once you have psychological safety, you're also more comfortable having disagreements and having discussions and having conflict. And sometimes we are too biased and only want harmony and consensus, and we don't create this room for friction. Diversity will naturally create friction, and it is our responsibility to cultivate that friction because so that we can hash out the pros and cons and really get to the, so the end goal, which is, which is the same for all of us, but how can we advance and how can we progress? So with lots of research in the areas, we see now companies are more intentional and are leveraging diversity to spur innovation. We see companies like Walmart who are going out there, they have these big campaigns and programs to actually get diverse inputs. They're recruiting women, they're going doing these community outreach programs and getting people from underrepresented communities to be part of the workforce because they believe that together with them, they can have a competitive advantage and create more innovative solutions. So to, to end it, I would like to just leave you with four tips on how we can create a more inclusive and diverse environment at the, our workplace so that we can accelerate innovation in, in, in our business. And number one is advocating collaboration. How can we break down the silos at work? How can we create multifunctional, multidisciplinary teams? And instead of promoting competition amongst our employees, how can we actually bring up the value of collaboration? How can leaders be measured on their ability to collaborate and build a team versus pursuing individual goals and individual um, um, yeah, individual agendas and individual objectives. Secondly, psychological safety. As a leader and as someone who has any responsibility for a team, it's really, really important that you give people that safety, that it's okay to fail, 
it's okay to dis disagree, and it's okay to vo voice your opinion, if it, even if it goes beyond the dominant conventional vision, 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 wisdom. And thirdly, challenge the conventional wisdom. So challenge, uh, create an environment, create these arenas where you purposely go in and argue and say, you know, what's the thing that we really, what's a strongly held belief that we have today that actually we need to challenge and then allow for that dialogue um, to take place. And lastly, I think most importantly, I think it's really important that we also educate our workforce on unconscious bias that exists today that systematically keep women, people of different backgrounds, people with disabilities, behind everybody else. So how can we educate them? How can we create courses, seminars, talk about the unconscious bias that exists today, have people share their stories so that we can actually put a name to the problem, address it, and then move on being a more collaborative and an inclusive society. So to conclude, I'll just say, let's make sure that we continue to hear voices that are different, uh, that think differently, people like Ketalin Carrico, and give them a platform so that they can bring their ideas that are going to be revolutionary, that will solve diseases, that will get us to Mars, and will really advance the overall cause of society. Thank you. Ah, so fantastic. Thank you so much, Nada. Thank you for your power and thank you for your speech. It's, uh, it's going uh, uh, direct into my heart. So thank you so much.